They got everyone covered. Okay. First Peter three is where we are at tonight. I will going to read, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to read the first seven verses and then we'll, then we'll pray and then we'll get into our study. A lot of what we're going to look at tonight will be just somewhat of a review so that uh, we can get our minds back to where we've been. So verse 1 of 1 Peter 3 says this, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Whose adorning, let it not be that, uh, be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold and of putting on of apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of the meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughter ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands dwell with them, according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Let us pray. Father, as we, Lord, as we come to a familiar text tonight, Lord, uh, I pray that as we get the history behind what what Peter was thinking about, Lord, that, that it would uh, really uh, illuminate the text so that we can better understand what has taken place here. So, Lord, uh, tonight as we go through a little bit of a review, I pray, and, and then into the, the, the one verse, Lord, pray you'll challenge our hearts, and we'll ask it all and pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'll get to your paper in a moment, but here we are back. Uh, I think I have on your paper here in just a little bit. We've been away since August 29th, and we've not been in this study. So for that reason, we are in need of somewhat of a review. But Peter, the, the letter that Peter writes here is he's writing to believers that were under persecution, um, living under Nero. Life was extremely difficult for them. Some believe they were already in the persecution. Some believe the letter was written before the persecution came about. Either way, they were either in it or they were going to go in it, one of the two. And so what he's, what he's doing with the letter is he's giving direction as to how believers are to live in those circumstances. So with that said, let me get you to your paper, if I could, and, and I'm going to walk you through where we're at and, and kind of bring into focus what we're looking at. It says, tonight we return to our study of First Peter. The last time we were in this study was August 29th, and for this reason we need a brief review. Peter's writing to believers who are scattered due to persecution. They're under Nero, and they are either suffering for their faith or they will shortly suffer for their faith in Jesus Christ. These believers were blamed for the fire which burned Rome, and because they were hated before the fire, this then provided a reason for the Romans to persecute them. The next word should be these. These believers would face some of the most severe persecution ever to come upon the church. We are currently in a section which Peter is addressing his readers concerning submission. Even in the face of persecution, they were to still live in a way that would glorify the Lord. So I want you to come back to chapter 2, and, and I'm going to walk you through chapter 2 here, if I could. But I, I want to start in verse 9. Uh, watch what he says about these believers in verse 9 of chapter 2, going to verse 12. He says this. He said, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. That you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but now are a people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, and that's what they did in that Roman Empire. Okay, watch this. That, that they may, by your good works, 
which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. So, okay, so here's the situation. I'll read the paragraph here in a moment. So you take that section out, 9 through 12, that I just read for you, and you understand this, that even under the persecution, they were required to live in a way that God was glorified. There is, there is no opening, no exception left for retaliation in this letter whatsoever. No, no, uh, no room for retaliating against those that, that would, uh, bring the persecution on them. But instead, as we go through this, we will see that they are called to submit. They are called to be ultimately models for, uh, the body of Christ in the midst of this very dark, corrupt society that they were in. Watch the uh, paragraph I have. Here in these verses, we see that as believers, we're living in such a way that we glorify God with our lives and that the unsaved will glorify God on the day of visitation. What's that mean? Here it is. Peter's desire here is that when the unsaved watch the way we live, they will have a desire to know the very Lord we serve and follow and that they will get saved. That's his, that's the whole point behind verse 12 that they, uh, that he says that they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation uh, or on the day whenever they would get saved, that God will be glorified and that they would get saved by the way that they watch your life. And so, so regardless, I, I take that and I look and I say this, that regardless of what I'm under, my responsibility is to live to glorify God. Sometimes life is extremely difficult, but even in those situations, it is my responsibility to live in a way that glorifies God, that makes him known, to handle the pressure different than what the rest of the world would, would ha how they would handle the pressure. We are to be different. We are, if I were to go back to verse 9, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we are to live in a way that people see the change in our life. And one of the ways is whenever we are under pressure, whenever we are under stress, whenever we are under, if it be that persecution, whether it be from the government, whether it be from, from uh, in, in our workplace or whether it be in the family, wherever, we're to be different in the way that we handle it. So let me show you the next line. Watch this. Peter then goes on to point out three areas of life where we as believers have an opportunity to live in such a way that our lives impact others. Okay, so so this is these are some of the things that we've already looked at, but but we need these. Okay, so so the first area of life that he points to, I have here under government. It could be, we could label that as in society, in society. So if if you were to break it down, and you'll see this in a minute, there are three areas in life where you and I have the greatest opportunity to impact the others. One is in society or under government. Watch 13 through 17. So here's what he says about living in society. He says, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For it is, for so it is the will of God that, that with well-doing you put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as servants of God, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. It's a pretty powerful statement at the end. Honor the king, considering they are under Nero. Okay, so come back to your paper. Here we see how we are to be model citizens. That's what we are to be. We are to submit to the authorities who are over us, for they have been ordained by God. So that's Peter's idea here. You submit to the laws. You follow the laws. You do what the government says. You, you follow the laws. And, be, and here's what we use to, to show you. Romans 13, 1 through 5 shows you that the government is ordained by God. Watch this. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there's no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. 
For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt praise of the same. For, okay, he, that is, the person that is in the position of authority, he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. So what Peter's saying is, you know, or what Paul's saying here is submit, submit to the authorities, follow the laws, not only for if you don't, you're under the wrath of the authorities, but also for conscience sake, to have a clear mind. And so that's what we are to do. That's what Peter is calling for right here. There is an exception. Watch your paper. We are to be model citizens by submitting to the government, but not if the government is commanding us to walk in disobedience to the word of God. If the, if the government says do something that is contrary to, word, to the word of God, then we don't have to do that. We don't have to submit to that. Acts chapter 5, 28 through 30, whenever the, uh, when the apostles were, were taken and, and confronted by the religious leaders, here's how they responded. The religious leaders said, saying, did we not straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. And Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. The fathers, uh, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. So we use that and we've used it a lot to help us understand. We, we walk in obedience to the government. I told you, I've told you over and over again, I'm not anti-government. We need the government. We need that. And if you don't have some kind of authority over people, then, then what you have is just uh, rampant lawlessness is what you have. And so you see it in these places where they have chose to uh, basically abolish the police force and then things get completely out of control. That was never the will of God. But um, anyhow, we submit to the authorities unless they command us or they direct us to do something that is contrary to God's word. God's word, as we've talked about before, it tells us that we're to preach the gospel. If they tell us we can't preach the gospel, then we don't have to submit to the authorities. God's word tells us that we're to gather together and, and praise and worship our God and study his word. If they tell us we can't gather together, then we have the responsibility of going against the authorities that are over us. And sure, there will be consequences. There will be consequences. But that's what comes with standing for the Lord. That's, that's where it's at. So the first area that he points out is in society. We are to be model citizens. I am to go out and I am to live and, and I am to obey the laws and, and I am to be a model citizen so that even in times of persecution, people see me and they say, you know what, that guy, at least that guy's obeying the law and they got nothing to use against me. That, that they could say, well, he professes to be a believer, but watch how he lives. That's not the way I'm to live. I'm to be obedient to the law of, unless it's against the word of God. And I am to submit to the authority and be the model citizen for the unsaved world to see. Because back to verse 12 again, I am to glorify God with my life. And so are you. So that eventually people will see us as being different and able desire to come to the Lord that we follow. So that's the first area in society or under the government. The second one is in the workplace. So he's going to cover three areas here. The second one's in the workplace. Watch 18 through 21. He says, servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience sake toward God endure grief, suffering wrong fully. For what glory is it when if when you're buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently. But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. So he goes from society to the workplace, two places. And I know a lot of you are retired and you say, well, that doesn't pertain to me. And so, but you still have an opportunity. Watch what I have here on your paper. Here in this section, Peter instructs his readers and us that we're to be model employees. So we're to be model citizens, but here now we're to be model employees. Believers are to be, are to submit to those 
whom they work for, and if mistreated, we're not to retaliate, but we're to endure it patiently. Just as in society, we're to do all we can to reach the loss with how we conduct our lives. Now, before we move on to the next area of life, which Peter addresses, or, uh, let us consider why Peter would feel as though these areas of life need to be addressed. Okay, so here it comes. What, why's he got to? Why's he got to tell me to be the model citizen? Why's he got to tell these people to be the model citizen? Why's he got to tell them to be the model employee? Why's he got to tell me to be the model employee or you to be either one? So watch this. There's a temptation whenever we get saved to see ourselves above the government or above taking orders from an unsaved boss at work. Now, uh, just listen to me. There are a lot of believers that will look at those that are in authority in the government and they say, you know what, I don't have to take advice. I don't have to take, I don't have to take uh, uh, direction from somebody that is not a believer. Okay, well, I will go back to Romans 13 and say that Paul ordained those that are in places of authority. And even if they are not believers, and many of them are not, they are still the ministers of God. You say, yeah, but look at how they live. And I say, I know that. What you got to understand is those people that have put, been put in places of authority, they will answer for how they conduct their lives in those positions someday. Politicians don't understand that, but they are going to be held to a higher level of accountability because of where they're at, that they're in a position where they're serving God and God has permitted them to be placed in that position. But back to the whole scene again. So there are people that would look at a situation and they say, I don't have to submit to a guy that's not saved. I don't have to submit to an authority that is not saved. I don't have to, why should I submit myself to a boss that is not saved? And so what they do is they go around in life and they, they have basically this uh, attitude that they are above all of that. Maybe it, maybe it comes from Ephesians chapter two in knowing this, watch verses one through six. And you, Paul writing about the believers in Ephesus, you, you have he, God, quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together, made us sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So people, uh, certain believers may look at that and say, look, I'm above this. I'm above this. And, and so I, why do I have to submit to an unsaved boss? Whenever uh, I'm a believer, why do I have to submit to those in authority that are not saved? Number one, because God tells us to. That's the, that's the bottom line. And, and that, those are situations in which we are in where we have an opportunity to glorify God, even so more. Okay, watch the next paragraph. These verses in Ephesians tell of our new position in Christ. And Paul wants his readers to know about their new life in Christ. But none of us are to be so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. Okay, and that happens to people. They're so heavenly minded that they are no earthly good. And that's not the way it's to be. Yeah, I am, I am a new person. I'm a new creation in Christ. Not a, there's no doubt about that. I am in Christ. And in God's mind, according to verse 6 on the screen, that, that I've been raised up together and made to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He sees me in a glorified state already. Okay, so that's, that's true of me, but I'm still here. I'm still here, and I have been left here with the whole mission of glorifying God with my life. And, and I can't control the circumstances, not all of them that come into my life. I can't control them. And so sometimes you and I may find ourselves under very oppressive authority. And, I, and as I've said before, I think that's coming down the road. Very oppressive authority. In those times, it is my responsibility to live in such a way that glorifies God. Not to look at the authorities and say, well, you don't have any authority over me. I'm a believer. I'm a believer. Well, just remember, God ordained that authority. And that individual has that position because God placed them 
in that position. And if it's at work, I have no right to look at my supervisor at work and say, uh, you know what, you don't have any authority over me. I'm a believer and you're not a believer. You're an unbeliever. So you have nothing on me. That's wrong. That's just flat out dead wrong. That is not the way that we are to live our lives. Back to your paper again, middle of that paragraph now, as believers, we're not to think that we're above the government, nor are we to think that we need to, we, we do not need to submit to unsaved authority, whether it be to governmental authorities or a supervisor at work. As believers, we're to submit even more now than when we were not saved. You have more of a responsibility now as a believer to submit. That's what you are to do. That's what I am to do. We are now ambassadors of our Lord. Peter even gives us the example to follow, and I'll get to that in a moment. Okay, so think about this. As a believer, I am even more accountable now to submit to that authority, based, more so than what I, what I was then whenever I wasn't saved, because now I know more. I know that I am, I am the ambassador of Christ, and I am there to represent him, and so therefore I am to submit, and I am to glorify God, and and I'm to be different. And if you want to make an impact on somebody at work or wherever it might be, if you want to make an impact, just be a submissive minded individual and watch the difference. Now, you may get taken advantage of for a while, but I can assure you this, that eventually the, the end result will be that you will have an impact on that individual's life. And, and I don't want to go into the story, but I've lived that in my life. I've lived that working for an organization out of Pittsburgh that the, the boss's son was extremely uh, wicked, uh, corrupt. Uh, that's putting it mildly and had all kinds of authority over me to be able to, to be able to terminate my position. Uh, and so instead of, instead of button heads with him every day, which would have been very easy to do, I chose to, just basically treat him with kindness. And, and I'll say this, I almost didn't have a tongue left whenever I left that job site because I had to bite my tongue so many times, so many times. But the end result was this. When I left there and, and, and uh, it was months later, maybe a year later, I don't remember, but he called and, and we finally connected and uh, he called to say, Keith, I, I just wanted to let you know I went to a retreat and I got saved. And uh, I, I would have never expected that from him. His name was Mark. I would never have expected that. But he said this to me. He said, it wasn't so much what you said, but here's what he said. And I don't say this in a boastful way. He said it was the way that you handled yourself at work. On the, there was a Penn Lincoln school that we were building. So, uh, and I'm nothing. God chose to use me in that situation to get Mark to come to the Lord, and, and I was just somebody that come along and sowed a seed. But anyhow, I say all that to say that that submissive spirit has a tremendous impact on people. It really does. Watch our example, uh, chapter 2, 21 through 25. It says, for even hereunto were ye called, because, okay, here comes the example, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but now ye are returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. So in that, par in that portion right there, Peter points to our example, and that is our Lord, in a way that he lived his life. Watch, the, watch what I have here. If ever, if ever there was someone who was above those who persecuted him, it was our Lord. But he never slandered his oppressors, nor did he threaten them. He submitted because there were souls at stake, our souls. He had come to seek and to save the lost. He was in the middle of the Father's will, and he trusted the Father in the midst of the persecution. Jesus, and I want you to catch this line, Jesus was more concerned with reaching the lost than he was silencing his oppressors. Hmm. I wish we could say the same about, I wish, I'll just say this, I wish I could say the same about my life sometimes. Have you ever been in one of those situations where 
You just want to say something to silence somebody that is mocking you or whatever. And it really doesn't do any good to get into that uh, verbal battle. It doesn't do any good at all. Our, our main concern ought to be on reaching the lost and conducting ourselves in a way that others see Christ in us. And so that's what Jesus was more concerned with reaching the lost. He was on a mission. He was going to the cross to die for the sins of the world. The, the silence, the oppressors, that would come later. There will be a day whenever every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. But that wasn't the time. That was not the time. And I will say this. There will be a day whenever people will know who we are. Right now we are veiled. As the, as the bride of Christ, we are veiled. And people don't understand how significant we are. They don't understand that in the world in which we live in right now, our presence holds back the evil spirits. They don't know that. They have no clue about that. They don't know that we are children of God. They don't know that we will rule and reign with him in the kingdom. They have no clue about those things. But there will come a day whenever all that will be revealed. Now is not the time. Now is not the time to silence the oppressors. Now is the time to live in such a way that people see Christ in me and in you. Now let me go on. Now Peter will address the third area of life in which the believer has the opportunity to reach the lost. So, so okay, let, let me just review it. So you got, we are to be model citizens and we are to be model employees. Those two areas, those are two big areas in a, in a person's life that out in society, the way that we conduct ourselves in the work area, the way that we conduct ourselves, those two areas are big. But there's a third one, and that is number three, the family. The family. Okay, so those are, you got a, a chance to impact people in society. You have a chance to impact people in, the, in, the, in if you still work in the workforce and also in the family. So let me read one through seven, and then we'll start to pick this apart here just a little bit. Verse one says this of chapter three. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may be without the word, with, or they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be outward adorning of plaiting of the hair and wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is the, in the sight of God of great. Price. Let me say this, okay, let me just, and we're not there yet, and we won't get there till next week, but a lot of people want to misuse verse 3, and they want to say that a woman should never braid her hair, and she should never wear gold, and they stop there, okay, if you're going to, if somebody's going to do that with that verse, you got to go to the third part and say, neither should they wear clothes, see what it says? outward adorning and plaiting of the hair and wearing of gold and putting on of apparel. So many uh, legalists have taken that and said a woman shouldn't, shouldn't braid her hair and she shouldn't wear any kind of jewelry. I just want to say this. I appreciate you ladies to do your hair. It doesn't put me on a spot whenever you come in, you know, and I got to look at you with everything stood on end uh, and keep from laughing. I don't have to do that. So, uh, that, that's not what he's saying. That's not what he's saying at all. But what he's but what he's saying is that's not what's important. We'll get into this. I don't want to go too far. But what's important in a woman is what's in the heart. That's what's important. The the inner man, the hidden man. That's what he says. Watch verse four again. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah, watch this, here's the model Sarah. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, so long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. That, that verse amazes me. Sarah is the model, not Christy Brinkley. Uh, that's about the only one I could name from my day. I just drew a blank. I don't know any of the other ones. I don't know any of the other ones. But anyhow, you know what I'm saying, okay? You know what I'm saying. Uh, Sarah is the model. And then could you imagine this today, that saying that a woman is to call her husband Lord or Master? 
we'll get into all this when we go through. Okay, verse 7, life is ye husbands dwell with them according to the knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Okay, so back to your paper. There are several points to see in the, in the overview of these verses. First of all, okay, I want to make something very clear, and that is the context. Watch this, because this is so, so many times it's taken out of context and it's misapplied. Now watch this. These, it should say verses, deal with a family in which one spouse is saved and the other is not. Understand that. That's the, that's the setting. Okay, so under this, under this Roman, uh, in this Roman Empire, what's happened is that, that one of the spouses has come to know the Lord. Here he's dealing with the wife. Okay, first of all, but let me go on with this. The one spouse has come to Jesus after they were married. This is not addressing the Christian family in which both the husband and the wife are saved. That's not the context. This passage is here to give spiritual guidance to the saved spouse concerning how to win the lost spouse to the Lord. That's what the context is. Watch verse 1 again. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may be without the, may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. So it's dealing with, with here in, in the first six verses, it's dealing with the wife that is saved and the husband is not. So it's not, it's not a Christian family. That's not what's being addressed here. And I want you to understand that. Uh, there's a lot of application for the Christian family, but that's not the context. The context is that somewhere along the line, after they were married, because we know this, that, that, God, that, that, that God says that we are not to be unequally yoked together uh, with unbelievers. So uh, this is not saying, well, they got married and one wasn't saved. I mean, you could apply it that way. But the whole setting here is that, that along the line, one of them got saved. And so, okay, what do I do in that situation? We'll get to that in a moment. Okay, but B, I want you to watch B here for a moment. The wife gets more attention from Peter. She gets six verses. The guy gets one. Now, I could use that if I was so minded and say, well, the woman's a, more, a little lot more hard-headed, you know. It, it takes a lot more to drive her home. But I would be wrong if I said that. I mean, I might be right in some circumstances, but... Uh, chances are the man's more hard-headed in that. But that's not why there's six to one. That's not why. And so you need the history of this. And the history really, it breaks my heart to understand what a woman dealt with back then. So I did my best to dig some things out. So watch this. I want to point out in, in these seven verses that six are addressed to the wife and one to the husband. Why is this? The reason is because life was much more difficult for a woman who came to Jesus and her husband was not saved than it was for a man who came to Jesus and his wife was not saved. A whole lot more difficult, and you don't even begin to understand it. Maybe this history right here will help you. Watch this. In every sphere of ancient civilization, women had no rights at all. Under Jewish law, a woman was a thing. She was owned by her husband in exactly the same way as he owned his sheep and his goats. On no account could she leave him, although he could dismiss her at any moment. For a wife to change her religion while her husband did not was unthinkable. In Greek civilization, the duty of the woman was to remain indoors and to be obedient to her husband. It was a sign of a good woman that she must see as little hear as little, and ask as little as possible. She had no kind of independent existence and no kind of mind of her own. And her husband could divorce her at, almost at caprice so long as he returned her dowry. Let me tell you what else he could do. He could kill her without any repercussions if he chose to do so. She was a thing. Back then, in the first century, she was, the woman was a thing. He owned her, just like he owned a donkey or sheep or goats. It's the way it was. So let me go on with this. Under the Roman law, a woman had no rights. In law, she remained forever a child. When she was under her father, she was under the 
I don't know how to pronounce that, but it means the father's power, which gave the father the right even of life and death over her. When she married, she passed equally into the power of her husband. She was entirely subject to her husband and completely at his mercy. Completely. The father could determine if the daughter lived or died at any time. So could the husband. When she was handed over, she was handed right over with that same power was given to the husband. Let me go on. The Roman Cato wrote, If you were to catch your wife in an act of infidelity, you can kill her with impunity without a trial. What a contrast with Christianity, which commands husbands to love their wives unconditionally. Roman matrons were prohibited from drinking wine. Enitus beat his wife to death when he found her doing so. Galeas dismissed his wife because she had once appeared in the streets without a veil. Vestus divorced his wife, divorced his wife because she, he saw her secretly speaking to a freed woman in public. Sophus divorced his wife because once she went into the, went to the public games. The whole attitude of ancient civilization was that no woman could dare take any decision for herself. What then must have been the problems of the wife who became a Christian while her husband remained faithful to the ancestral gods? It is almost impossible for us to realize what, mu what life must have been for the wife who was brave enough to become a Christian. We don't understand it. We don't know. We don't know. Many women probably died because they had come to know Christ as Savior, because then they went against what their husbands believed. Some of them, no doubt, came to Christ and probably never said a word because of the situation that they were in, knowing that if that was ever made known to the husband that they would die. So let me go on here. So I'm, I'm going to raise a couple questions. A woman becoming a Christian in the first century would be faced with many questions. Should I leave my husband? Should I change my behavior towards him? Should I assume a superior position to him because now I am in Jesus? Should I submit to him since he is not a Christian? These are all legitimate questions for a lady in the first century. So Peter is going to give instructions to the woman in six verses and to the men in one verse. That's why you have six to one. It was not near as difficult for the man. Although I will say this. The instructions that are in verse 7 for the man would have been completely contrary to what society believed. So it's not that it was easy for a man. If he was going to follow the, the will of God in the family, he was going to have to love his wife in such a way that would be completely contrary to what society had taught. Either way, it was not easy. It was not easy. But it was exceptionally difficult for the woman. Many of them would have died for the fact that they came to Christ. So what Peter is going to do as we go through this, he's going to answer basically these questions that I raised here. What's my behavior to be like? Should I leave my husband? Should I assume a superior position? Do I have to submit to him since he is not a Christian? A lot of really good questions that would have been asked with the women. And so Peter's going to give the instructions. So this is going to be part one of a believing wife with an unsaved husband. And we're only going to look at one verse tonight, and that's verse one. But watch it. Likewise, stop for a moment. You got to understand that words there pointing back to what was just prior. What was just prior? The example of Christ. Okay, we'll get to that in a moment. Likewise, you wives. Be in subjection to your own husbands. That, here comes the reason. If any obey not the word, in other words, if, if, if they are not interested in hearing the Bible and what God has to say about the need of salvation, watch this, that the, they also may be without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. And I'll get into that here in a moment. But let me just start here with what I have set up for you. There's much to see within this verse the first word of the verse is very important. The word likewise looks back to the example of Jesus in the previous chapter. Just as he endured suffering to win the loss, so the, way, the, so the saved wife, too, was to endure suffering in order that she would reach her husband with the gospel. 
The unsaved wife was not to leave her husband. She was not to see herself as superior to her husband. She was not to dominate her husband. She was to submit to her husband. Whether he was saved or not, in God's design for the family, he was the head of the family. She was to submit to him. That was the bottom line. She was to submit to him. And she was to submit to him with the whole intent of eventually winning him to the Lord. So watch this. She was not to constantly preach to him, but instead she was to live in such a way that he would be one without a word. Now, let me read the verse again. I don't want you to be confused on something here. It says, likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. Now, that doesn't mean, and I'm going to show you here in a moment, it doesn't mean that somebody can be won without hearing the Bible. That's not what he's saying. That's not what Peter's saying. What he's saying is, instead of constantly, and constantly, for lack of a better word, nagging him, just be quiet and live the life. That's what he's saying here. Let me go back to this. I'll read that paragraph again. She was not to constantly preach to him, but instead she was to live in such a way that he would be one without a word. In other words, she was to live in such a way that her husband could see Jesus Christ in her life. This verse is not saying that the husband would be one without hearing the word of God. No one's saved without hearing the word of God. Romans chapter 10, let me show you the verses 13 through 15, and then verse 17, it says this. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So he's not saying that the man's going to be one without hearing the word. Uh, James chapter 1, verses 18 through 21 says this, Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. See that? With the word of truth. That we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. So, okay, I just want to make something very clear. He's not saying that if, if the woman just leads a perfect Christian life, that the guy's going to get saved without hearing the word of God. That's not going to happen. So I, I want to say this to you and I, okay? We, get, we are to go out and, and if I were to back up, I'm to go out into society and I am to lead the model life. I'm to be the model citizen. And at work, if I work in a secular place, I'm to be the model employee. But those people are not going to be one if they don't hear the gospel. So they got to hear the gospel. Okay. So that's, I just want you to understand that's not what he's saying here. Watch. Let me go on. The point which Peter's making is that the woman can share the gospel with her husband, but then there comes a time when the best thing to do is live the new life in Christ in front of him and start with, start with submission to start with submission. The woman was to allow the Holy Spirit to live the life of Jesus through her. And this would then bring forth the fruit of the Spirit, which, which is in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Watch this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. In other words, whenever she submitted not only to her husband but to the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God will produce the fruit of the Spirit, which would be something the husband would never expect. He would never expect it, especially if he was mistreating her. Let me go on. When a woman's life produces these characteristics, it will speak loudly to her husband. This verse, uh, that's verse 1 again, reveals something which is very important to grasp. God certainly uses the word to reach the hearts of the lost, and he will also use the godly lifestyle of the righteous to reach the heart of the lost. So if you have a loved one or a friend that will not listen to the word of God, then remember that God will also use your godly lifestyle to reach them. Don't forget that. This should be a great encouragement to all of us. We've all come to the place with someone where we just do not know what to say anymore. Here we see that the proper thing to do is just live the Christian life and let God do his work in their hearts. Before I end this, let me also say that the saved wife still has the responsibility of speaking out about her husband's sin 
and its consequences. This is what love does. It warns people. But it does not constantly pound on the individual. There comes a time when you say what you can say, what you can, and then you give it over to the Lord. Okay, I, I'm going to finish this out, and then I'm going to give you an example. Next week, we will continue in the text. But tonight, I want to leave you with encouragement that God will use our godly lifestyles to bring the lost to salvation. He can do it as we become model citizens. He can do it as we become model employees. And he can do it as the saved wife submits to her husband. That, uh, uh, as, as the wife submits to the husband, does not nag him and just lives her new life in Christ in front of him. So I was reading uh, something at J. Vernon McGee, and, and, I, and I, I hate it that I can't do the imitation of his voice because I always liked the when he was telling a story, that old country drawl that he had, okay? But he told a story about a lady and that was in his church that, uh, that had a husband that was not saved. And she came to, the, to him and she said, you know, I don't know what to do. She said, uh, when he gets up for work in the morning, I get up. And she said, I cry for him. I cry and I plead with him to come to the Lord. She said, whenever he comes home, he said, I, 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 at, the, at the dinner table, I cry with him and I plead with him to come to the Lord. And, and uh, McGee said this, he said, could you imagine that guy's life? You get up in the morning to a ballin' woman and you come home to a ballin' woman. That's, I'll tell you what, it'd make me want to work long hours, I'll say that. So she came and looked for advice, what do you do? And he said, just stop that. She said, what do you mean? She said, he said, just stop it. And I'm paraphrasing his story, but basically stop putting the Bible verses in the bottom of his lunch box and pasting them on his thermos or wherever you're pasting them. Just stop it. Just stop doing that. Just treat him with love and respect. Just treat him with kindness. That man came to know the Lord a little bit after that. She struggled with that. She thought that she needed to constantly be hounding him but what that was doing was it was driving him away is what it was doing when she let up and she started to be submissive and just let him go and trust him to the lord he eventually came to know the lord as his savior and so i say this uh i don't know your situations in life i don't know all of them but i'm sure you know somebody that you would like to see saved and, and we could take this and apply it to it one of our children you know you got a son or a daughter and you want to see them saved and you, you, you got to, you, they come to your house and every time the subject comes up, you know, you know how it is. It turns into a heated argument. And so you, you, you've come to the place where it's like, I don't even know what to say anymore. Then how about this? How about don't say anything? Just live the life in front of them. Just live the life. Treat them with respect Treat them with honor. You don't have to condone their sin. You don't do that. You take a stand against sin, but you treat them with love. Treat them with love. Don't be hard on them. Don't be pounding them. That, that, I just, I hate that. Whenever I hear parents that just constantly finding the negative about the child, this, that, you know, that this is negative. That's negative. This, if I'm that kid, I'm not, I'm thinking, not, you know what, mom and dad, I don't want to come around because if it's just negative all the time, I don't need that. I don't need that. There's enough negativity in the world. They don't need that. Try the love route. Try that. You might find out that that has a greater impact. Uh, I remember Dick Johnstone, Denise's dad, used to always say to me, Pastor, you catch more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. How true that is, isn't it? How true it is. So as we go out in the world, keep in mind those three areas. You come back next week. We'll get into detail, ladies, about what God sees as beauty in your life. Uh, and, and sure, it's talking about a, 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 a divided family, one saved, one not. But there's also application for where both are saved, too. And so we'll look at that next week. So let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that we can, Lord, tonight we could get the history. We could understand why why'd Peter give six verses to the woman and one to the man. And now we know because life for the woman back in that first century was far from easy.
Far from easy. Nothing like it is today. Absolutely nothing like it is today. So, Lord, I, I pray that, uh, Father, as we work our way through this, that Lord, the Spirit of God would take the verses and teach and instruct us, and that, Lord, that we would be receptive. And, Lord, there's application, not just between a husband and a wife, but even to our kids. And so, Lord, maybe there's somebody, I'm sure there is somebody here tonight, and you got children, and, and they, they want to see them saved. And, Lord, they've, they've said things that's turned into heated arguments before. Help them to understand this, that, Lord, what an encouragement to know that as we live that model life, that you can use that to bring somebody to Christ. So, Lord, uh, take the message, use it tonight for your honor and your glory. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.